Welcome to Wine Soundtrack South Africa. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Morena Kalo and today I have the pleasure of chatting to Michael Milan from Simonsig Wines. Uh, Michael, a very warm welcome. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Hi, Marina. Um, it's good to be on the podcast. Um, yes, I am Michael Milan. I am the third generation winemaker or winemaker of the Milan family of Simonsach. Um, after my grandfather started the, the estate in the in the fifties, early fifties. So, um, a proud heritage um, that we are following in the wine in, in the South African wine industry. Um, I grew uh, born and bred in um, in Stellenbosch on the farm, on the estate, um, and then went to university uh, at Stellenbosch, studied viticulture and winemaking, um, and thereafter travelled the world a bit, did a couple of harvests abroad in Australia, uh, travelled France and, it- and Italy, um, and then uh, did a stint of winemaking up in the Emelin Arde, about an hour's drive from here, and then um, eventually decided to come back to the estate uh, where I'm now the, the red winemaker and viticulturist on, on Simonsach. That's really, it's such a lovely story, and, and I always enjoy hearing about these family farms that have kind of passed on the baton because it doesn't always happen you know it doesn't always happen that the the children share the love and the passion of the forefathers so it for me it's it's a lovely story to hear how how you are now next in line to to take over that baton tell me Simon Sich, where where is it located so Simon Sach is located um, about five kilometers outside of the town called St- uh, Stellenbosch, um, uh, on the northern side of Stellenbosch, so not too far out of town, um, on the top of uh, the Bottleray Hills and on the slopes of, so in between the Bottleray Hills and the Simonsburg Mountains. And at the moment, how much land is under vine? So our estate is about 300 hectares, um, which is, and then 200 hectares under under vine. Um, we have, I think, it's about 18 different uh, cultivars planted. Um, most of it is for uh, Cap Classic, which is a, a, a focus of our estate. Um, but we'll probably get back to that later. Um, and then we also focus on Cabernet and uh, Pinotage, um, which we really think is, is well suited for, for our terroir on Simonsag. And tell me, what is your average annual production uh, of wine? Um, yes, so we do about two and a half thousand tons um, between all our different wines. Um, so we have quite a bit of a portfolio um, from the Cup Six of sparkling wines, um, then wh- still white wines from the day-to-day easy drinking wines uh, to the more wooded um, barrel f- fermented white wines, and then also unwooded red wines to the more premium um, red wines, yes. You mentioned Cap Classique and it would be silly of me not <laughs> to go into a little bit more detail there. What is the story with Simon Sich and Cap Classique? Yeah, so my grandfather um, traveled traveled to Champagne or France and Champagne um, in 1970 or 1969 and um, then saw this whole, um, or the, the magic that is being produced in, in Champagne and how they do it and the technique behind it. Um, but back then, there weren't any uh, Chardonnay vines or Pinot Noir vines um, in South Africa by then. So he decided, yeah, no, he's gonna try his luck. Um, 
the whole pioneer he is. I mean, he, he, um, I think he has a, he had a integral role in the in the South African wine industry and where it is now. Um, so he tried his luck with uh, bottle fermented Chenin Blanc um, because it's so widely available and we had a lot of, on the estate um, and it was one of our first wines that we bottled um, under our own label. So he said no, for the, um, he's going to uh, ferment Chenin Blanc in the bottle again um, to create uh, South Africa's first bottle fermented sparkling wine. Yeah. And that was really the beginning of something amazing for our country. And we, last year in 2021, we celebrated 50 years of Cap Classique, which really, I think, is a fantastic milestone. Um, I was here on the lawns of Simon Sech on that very special day when there was a celebration. And um, <clears throat> you opened a rather spectacular bottle, massive bottle. I think it was a five liter or something like that, a nine of, um, of Cap Classique and uh, it really is something that I think our country does exceptionally well and can compete um, on a shoulder to shoulder level with uh, French champagne. What, what, what would you say? Yeah, I think um, from the early days to now, um, our sparkling wine or Cap Classique industry really. Um, have made leaps and bounds of quality improvements. Um, I think also um, with the formation of the, the Cup Classic Association and um, that keep on um, evolving the, the quality and the technology and the insights and the knowledge, uh, yeah, the knowledge um, in, in the winemaking itself and the viticulture behind it. Um, we, I think we can truly say we uh, firstly offer great value for money, um, but the quality is up there with the best. That is for sure. So Simon Sech is pretty much a household name here in South Africa, but which markets would our listeners potentially be able to find uh, Simon Sech wines in? Yeah, we, we export to about 54 countries across the world um, so some of our biggest um, export countries are Sweden um, Germany UK uh, Netherlands um, America uh, yeah so, so it's, we are spread almost all, all across the world yeah that's it's it's quite a large footprint, and I, I think you're available in the Far East as well in Far certain East, countries, Hong Kong. Hong Kong yeah. So um, let's chat a little bit about yourself. Um, what would you say? Obviously, you you grew up on the farm, so wine was all around you all the time. Do you have a specific memory of a moment where it suddenly just clicked for you? You just kind of went, "Wow, this is this is it. This is special." Yeah, I think growing up on the farm and your father being a winemaker, your your grandfather being a winemaker. So I spent as a as a little boy. Obviously, um, every school holiday had to work in the vineyards or in the cellar. Um, but in a way, that almost later on almost demotivated me to become a winemaker or come back to the farm. And I was actually on my way to become to, or to, into be enrolled as an engineer in <laughs> at Stellenbosch University. Um, but for, before that, I took a gap year and ended up doing a uh, vintage in uh, the northern part of Italy in Trento. Um, at a, at a, also a Cap Classic or a Spumante uh, producer called, called Ferrari. Um, and the owner there, uh, Marcello, um, he told me before, and me and my friend were coming over. Um, and he told me before, and like, listen here, the seller staff, they don't really speak English. So I'm like, okay, no, it's fine. We're, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, so we went over, um, and they didn't speak any English. So everything on the, at the beginning was really like speaking with the hands and like showing and just like, yeah, just figuring it out. 
But um, after a while, I started to get into a rhythm and I knew the, you know, a seller more or less works the same right across the world. And I knew what to do and I felt at home, even though it was like quite an unfamiliar territory. Um, and right there and then I, I, I knew it was basically in my blood. Um, I actually phoned, phoned my father uh, later that day, or oh, yeah, that week, and I said, yeah, that, like, listen here, um, I know we, we enrolled in, for um, engineering, but um, yeah, I think we should change it to winemaking. I think he, he was driving at the moment, at that time, and he almost rolled the car. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it, 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 it's, it's, I think it is in, our, in my blood and I'm, I'm really happy where I am. That's a, such a cool story and um, comes back to what I was saying earlier about how it could have gone differently where, you know, you, you, you might not have been where you are today. So it's great. I'm, I'm very grateful that you are there. Um, you've traveled the world fairly extensively. Um, are there any um, wines foreign wines that you've had along your travels that have really stood out for you um, either good or bad sure <laughs> I think drinking a region's wine um, where it's made is always like inspiring so traveling their own drinking the, the Syrahs and the Grenaches and the Marsans and um, Sitting in Burgundy, eating stinky cheese, drinking um, a nice uh, Pinot Noir or a Chardonnay. Um, I think one of the most memorable, uh, yeah, we were actually moments in my wine career. I think we, um, funnily enough, we were um, a group of couple of sick producers. Um, and we were actually with we were going over to Portugal um, for for, uh, for with Amarum, um, and we did a cup classic benchmark tasting best of uh, best sparkling wines of Portugal versus best cup classics um, of South Africa, and we were sitting um, on the the high up on the banks of the Douro Valley or between the vineyards. Um, and we actually had a braai that uh, the Portuguese guys um, invited us to. We can braai and they'll spot, give the wines and we bring our, our wines and we have a day of it. That was, and afterwards obviously I had some ports also. Um, that was a really, really me memorable day, I think, in my wine travels. Mm. It certainly sounds like fun. And I think brying in Portugal, that uh, <laughs> yeah. must have been a pretty interesting experience <laughs> yeah. in itself. Yeah. Um, what is your flagship wine here at Simonsach? What is in that bottle and what does it cost? Yeah, so our, our um, flagship wine um, is the Tiara. It's a border style blend. Um, so it's always cab driven. Um, with Merlot, Cabernet Franc and Malbec. Yes, so it goes for about 250 Rand a bottle. Um, but uh, for me, uh, I really enjoy making our radial um, Pinotage, um, which is about 500 Rand a bottle. Um, but it's a, sing a really special site on the farm, um, Old Bushwein Pinotage Vineyards. Um, so it's a single site, um, and the the wine that comes, it, the, the vineyard or the wine makes itself. So that's it's such a such a nice wine vineyard to work with. Yeah, it is your your. Um, I must say, even though you are predominantly known for your Cap Classiques, I think your red wines are. Uh, an absolute treasure in themselves and I was fortunate enough, enough uh, to recently attend the latest launch of the tiara and uh, you opened up a, a number of older vintages for us and it's it really is incredible to see how that wine really evolves and changes and um, 
I'm excited to see, uh, even though you haven't been here that long, to see how <laughs> how your wines uh, perform in the future. So, which of the wines in the cellar give you the most pleasure at the moment? Whether it's whether it's just kind of seeing how they, they, they're changing or, or anything that just kind of makes you feel, oh, wow, this excites me. Yeah, we, um, we since about uh, 2013, we have started um, not playing around, but experimenting and make some, making small batches of um, her own uh, white cultivars. So Roussan, Marsan, um, Grenache Blanc, um, we've played around with some Bourboulink. Uh, we actually planted Picpoul Blanc and Bourboulink last year, um, which is really exciting. Um, and then, yeah, the, so we have a, like a, a more artisanal range, small batch wines um, called the Grapesmith wines. Those are always fun um, and nice to see and work with um, in in the cellar during harvest time because it's it's almost like a blank canvas or like a you you try all your experiments and see what happens with with those wines. Um, so it's like a it's like a yeah you can try what you want and if you read something during during the year or you tasted an interesting wine um, that's the arena where you can um, play around and now since the 2021 vintage we actually also um, did, uh, put a red wine into the uh, the mix or the range. Um, and then also some new cultivars uh, like Marcelan, which is a cross between Grenache and Cabernet, which uh, I really think uh, suits our um, area really well in the northern parts of Stellenbosch. It's a, it's a sm little bit hotter, so the cultivars that do well um, in our area is Pinotage and Cabernet. Um, but then also Chenin Blanc is our... Um, biggest yeah in the on the white wine side it's always a interesting um, cultivar to work with some interesting stuff i'm very excited to uh, see what what uh, it yields for us what about you what do you enjoy drinking as a consumer yeah that is that is a difficult question it's like <laughs> um i really enjoy cabernet um for me, I think it's maybe just growing up in Stellenbosch, uh, which is so known for for Cabernet. Um, but then on the white side, Chenin Blanc is probably uh, the the cultivar that I drink the most. Um, but yeah, I mean the, all the the, the new new uh, the new wave wines or cultivars that are in fashion now, like the Grenaches and the Mouvedres and all those stuff. They they it's it's always fun to drink um, and the different styles of that. And then in your free time, when you're not making wine in the cellar, what do you do? Yeah, so I really um, enjoy mountain biking. I think um, Salamosh has a world-class um, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of single track across all the mountains and the hills and um, over all the uh, vineyard estates or the wine estates. Um, but then um, I'm, a, uh, yeah, I love crayfish diving, so um, going to dive for crayfish and um, yeah, that's always fun. Uh, anything to do with the sea, I really enjoy. Um, but then in winter time, I enjoy some uh, hunting and obviously just spending time with family and friends. And are you into music? Any specific genres or groups or artists even? Music? Yeah, don't ask me to play any um, musical inter instruments because, <laughs> no, tried that, didn't work, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm alternative rock, uh, the classics, I think, um, everything like Bob Dylan, all those, and then this classic rock, I think for me is the, is, yeah, what I listen to. Mm. 
So that gets you going. And tell me, in the cellar, do you play music or are you perhaps one of those winemakers who chats to the wines or chats <laughs> to the vines even? Uh, I, yeah, I think, um, yes, I do play a lot of music um, in the cellar, in the harvest cellar. Um, just, I think it's to to motivate the people to you know because it can get the days can get long and tedious um, and it's quite it's quite a um, yeah tough day so listening to some some music um, is definitely lifts the the mood in the cellar and uh, gets people going. Okay, suppose you <clears throat> take your wife Mrs. Malan on a date. <laughs> What wine would you order for the table? Yeah, that is difficult always with my wife because she's also a winemaker. So it's like almost a, sometimes a, um, a battle, not a battle, but like who's going to pick the wine. Um, but yeah, it depends on the, the, the where we are, what, we, what the mood is, I guess. Um, but I think... Uh, Pinot Noir, we both love it. Um, I think w- while I was still working in the Yemelin Order, that's when we when we met. Um, so I think our relationship almost um, grew out of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Mm-hmm. That's um, that's a love story waiting to happen. Love with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, fantastic. Uh, are you a supporter of any sports teams, sporting individuals, that kind of thing? Yeah, obviously the Springboks um, and the Proteas, the rugby and cricket teams. But yeah, I'm, I was ecstatic last weekend when the Stormers uh, won their first major trophy in the um, URC. So um, yeah, that was a really um, a brilliant weekend for, for our sports and our rugby team. And if you could send a magnum of any of your wines to the Stormers to congratulate them, which one would you send them? I think um, when you celebrate something, it's obviously something to do with uh, sparkling wine. So at the Cops of Uncle um, will definitely have to, has to do the trick. Michael, what would you consider to be the best bit of advice you've ever received? Um, I think just to never give up um, for me is like if you fail it's just basically a way not to do it and you have to try again until you you get it right and um, or perfect something yeah and then if you could share a bottle of wine with anyone alive or dead who would you like to share that wine with and <laughs> what wine would you like to share? Yo. Ah, that's very difficult. Um, I think maybe somebody like... Uh, I'll share a glass of Pinotage um, with François Pinard. Um, who won the first Rugby World Cup, the captain of the first Rugby World Cup winner. Yeah. I think that could be an interesting uh, interesting evening for yeah. sure. Get, uh, swapping stories. Um, if you had to complete the following sentence, a table without wine is like... Yo. Yeah, no, I think it's just boring. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, very few meals go past in our um, household without without wine. So I don't know really how it is. <laughs> so. It's just a foreign concept yeah, altogether. No, a foreign concept. <laughs> I mean, uh, during harvest, um, one of one of my um, that I introduced or not. We, we sit around uh, the whole harvest team, um, so we usually get each year get a few um, interns from uh, right across the world. Um, uh, but then we sit down each evening, um, discuss the day, eat and drink interesting wines um, each evening during, during harvest. So that's, it's, I think, what makes harvest and, uh, yeah, 
it's definitely sharing wine and food together with friends um, is my my idea of fun. I think, you know, doing that after a long, hard, back-breaking day, often in, in very high temperatures outside in the, the Western Cape sun, um, it, it is something to look forward to, and it kind of restores your, your strength for the day ahead, <laughs> knowing that the next day is probably going to be quite <laughs> similar. Tell me... What sort of wine do you think will be drunk in the year 2300? Wow. <laughs> um, I'm a traditionalist, but if you think that far ahead, um, I think a lot of the wines and uh, the wines will be made almost autonomously, like robots and like, yeah, so maybe the the role of the winemaker will become less and less um but i i always believe that wine is made by the soul of a winemaker um so it's that love and attention um that goes into the wine the vines and the wine um that uh, it's almost a a, a portrayal of of the winemaker's personality and um, so it's what you put in you get out type of thing so I'm a bit scared if you ask questions like that <laughs> <laughs> no there's no wrong answer um, name any three wines that you would take with you to a deserted island any three any three from anywhere in the world yeah, I think a good Pinot Noir, a Burgundian Grand Cru type of, um, and then I think a bottle of Carps of Onkel, um, and I think just to keep it South African, a good Pinotage. I think that sounds like a very good way of, of whiling away the hours on a desert island for sure. Is there a winemaking area anywhere in the world that you still would really like to explore? Uh, I've actually never been to Bordeaux, so <laughs> strangely enough, yeah. So that is that's high up on my list, okay. yeah, and Chile. And Chile. Chile is uh, also very, very exciting and interesting. Okay, we're almost done. However, before we finish up, I'd like to play a little game with you. So, I'm going to mention three varieties, and you need to pair each variety with a song, or a music artist, or a genre that you feel reflects that variety best. Okay. Okay. Now, simply because you mentioned it earlier, let's start off with Marcelin. Uh, Marcelin. I think, okay, so, I think it's, I'll like a classic jazz um, I think it's quite deep but s still not uh, like the, the depth of the, the um, cabernet but you still get this s smooth and silkiness of Grenache that's very cool I like that okay let's go with Pinot Noir Pinot Noir um, Tio soft rock like uh, just an easy rock and roll. Um, yeah, I think it has. It, yeah, it's also got a, a lot of just a bit of soul. You know. So, yeah. Now I think we should finish off with a pinotage. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, pinotage. That's a difficult one. I think because it's got heaps and bounds of, of lots of fruit and structure um, and obviously I have to keep it South African so I think uh, like a um, like a hip hop South African hip hop type of uh, yeah it's, a lot, it's, just, it's an interesting cultivar with uh, lots of lots of different um, sides to it and lot, it can be made in so many different styles so I think it's a it's a it's a like hip-hop it's also you can it's different styles styles of hip-hop also mm. 
I like that South African hip hop, something like Cuesta or yeah. something like that. Very <laughs> cool, very cool. Okay. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Uh, before we close off, please will you share with our listeners um, where they can find you online, on social media platforms, and also what can they expect if they were to visit Simon Sikh here in Stellenbosch? Yeah, um, I am on Instagram, uh, yeah, Michael Milan. I think it's like Mike389. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, Simon Sich has the, our website um, with all our wines um, that you can order online for South Africans or right across Europe um, and I think America to, for deliveries over there. So our online shop is quite, um, quite good uh, to, and yeah, all the descriptions of the wines. Um, and if you visit uh, Simonsach, it's a um, it's a lovely state. It's quite it's uh, all the old buildings, so and the old trees, and we've got a lovely um, big front lawn to sit under the trees and sip some Simonsach wines. Um, so in the summer or in the winter, we have uh, always got a nice. Uh, fireplace going so to keep you nice and cozy to, to enjoy the red wines and all the other wines yeah super thank you so much for chatting to us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day thanks for listening to a new episode of wine soundtrack south africa for details and updates visit our website winesoundtrack.com